end of Packets and Bolts, the podcast about technology, life, philosophy, everything in between. It is Monday, March 18th, 2019, our third episode, Duopoly Oligopoly, coming to you this spring eve eve. I'm your host, Muskrat, with co-host Mongoose. Hello. We've had quite a thought to, uh, this week. Um, almost had to get the rowboat out. Uh, luckily, my undisclosed location is higher than most other places in the state of Wisconsin, so I didn't have to revert to that, but uh, it's getting pretty damp out there. It is wet. Yeah, how about you? I'm not sure where you're... Uh, secure location is but hopefully it's not in a low-lying area i cannot divulge that i'm not getting giving any geographical clues but i am dry right now that's good hope you're not too dry i'm pre-gaming a little bit here a little humid but uh i have the secure lines of communication open up between us and uh yeah yeah well this it's been a while and we were a little delayed um I was at GaryCon uh, last week for uh, uh, the annual convention to honor Gary Gygax, uh, one of the founders of Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, we were trying to get a recording, an interview down there, but it didn't work out with the uh, participants that I was working with, but uh, maybe next year. But Lake Geneva, very, very nice, very nice area. You couldn't have uh, incorporated that into one of your games? Well, you know, I talked to several people about it, um, but schedules and everything else, and they were all uh, hosting games, and between that and yeah, drinking, so, it didn't work so out. So everybody's role-playing. Why couldn't you just kind of in character give the interview? I mean, I as, <laughs> long as, as long as you're doing it in character, who is your character? Uh, several. They were all pre-generated. And they all died immediately? <laughs> uh, let me think. We won. We survived, I mean. Uh, one, uh, we lost another, um, and then inconclusive, ran out of time on the other games. Have you ever had a D and D character or another role playing character just die of natural causes? No. I mean, I mean, not not, not like accidents, just like old age. No. Or heart attack or not, not unless it was um, like withering, like artificially aged. Because of a spell or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, with all the crazy stuff that happens in those things, uh, you would expect heart attacks to be more prevalent. Yeah, you know, that, I've never seen that happen. Especially when it's like, the most of the time when you're walking around, all you're eating, all I ever hear people about eating is just like mutton <laughs> or uh, <laughs> or bread. And lots of mead. Yeah. Yeah, hmm. Yeah, you stop the... the tavern, you just talk about drinking. You never eat anything decent. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to think about that. That's kind of interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I'll have to talk to some people about that. Or check online and see if they have some uh, compendiary of, you know, food and, and uh, nutrition and how that affect. You know, hey, minus one because you <laughs> didn't eat <enough> vegetables. <laughs> yeah, you could start a whole game system on that. I'm not sure a lot of people would play it, but it could be interesting. There's got to be diehards out there. Uh, that's true. Well, I know we had a rough a rough show in terms of headlines last time, but you know we got a fresh round of headlines for this evening. We have a word from our sponsor. Uh, we do have a listener email, uh, just one at least at the time that I last checked my inbox. Um, people email into the show. Don't that's hold right. back. That's Don't right. Hold back. Packets and bolts at gmail dot com. Um. You can ask us anything. Anything. You can ask or tell us anything. Now, we reserve the right to, uh, you know, We may chop have up a your rebuttal. Email. We well, may have too. a rebuttal, and you won't be able to respond to yourself unless you email back, of course. Yes, but we promise to, uh, to give your responses in some form. But, again, we do reserve the right to uh, modify um, any, any email in any context that we wish. Just saying. But it's worth it. Let's give true. it a shot. 
All right. Then, of course, the cocktail and uh, the the name of the show, Duopoly Oligopoly, about our two-party system, which isn't really a system. Uh, I really do get annoyed when people call it our two-party system, and some people actually think it's in the Constitution, but uh, the Founding Fathers did not write about two parties. Um, and, yeah. No, but somebody's calling it a system because they want two parties. I yes. think that's the point here. Yes. And it's time for us to start thinking about why. Right, and and the end result is whether or not it was designed that way. Um, that's what we ended up with because of plurality voting and winner take all. Okay, but we got time for that later. So <clears throat> let's let's dig right in here. Oh, I tell you this this one I just had to laugh. Um, this probably is one of the funnier headlines I've seen for a while. But, you know, maybe not. Your mileage may vary. But a man threatened to sue a magazine for using his picture to show a generic hipster. But it turned out that it wasn't him. So this guy... This guy thought he was the hipster. This guy thought he was the... The picture... The picture of the generic hipster this guy thought was him turned out not to be him. So very ironic, at least I see the irony in this, and uh, basically proved the point of the generic hipster um, issue, I guess. Uh, this is from Mashable, but uh, the MIT Technology Review recently covered a study that looked into the hipster effect. I didn't know that. I mean, you know, it, it makes sense, but I, I never heard of the hipster effect before. But according to the site's editor-in-chief, uh, Gideon Litchfield, uh, they immediately received an email after publishing their piece from an angry man claiming to be the article's pictured hipster. Um, so Litchfield claimed, uh, stated that the emailer claimed to be the nonconformist in the photo that MIT Technology Review chose to accompany the article. The hipster accused them of slander and using the image without his permission. Um, so the outlet immediately conta uh, contacted Getty Images, the stock photo company from which they licensed the picture. MIT Technology Review wanted to find out more about the release uh, this man in the photo had to sign in order to appear on Getty's website before uh, deciding whether or not to remove the photo. The Getty's legal team conducted a review. They found that the model in the photo did not share the same name as the person emailing MIT Technology Review. Maybe it was an alias. I mean, it's possible he, he made the thing up, I suppose, but uh, Litchfield said that after hearing back from Getty, the emailer conceded that he had misidentified himself in the photo. Oh, yeah, you're you're dead the rights there. I was thinking hmm. maybe this is the guy who was the original hipster. <laughs> the original maybe, hipster. <laughs> yeah, maybe he started the hipster trend, and then all generic, I mean, it just became generic because everybody tried to emulate this guy. So I'm thinking yes. maybe that's what he meant. Maybe it's he like was the archetype. people need to, yeah, may, people need to start, stop, you know, pr pretending to be me. Well, right, and I guess this whole study, um, there was a research, there was some research purporting to explain the hipster effect. The fact that nonconformists often end up nonconforming in the same way. But we used to talk about this in high school, and, you know, when everyone nonconforms, it's usually to do some other conformity, and this isn't new, although the hipster effect is quite funny. But the, um, you know, Dylan, uh, you know, that was one of the reasons why, and I'm not saying Dylan is like the, uh, I don't know, the pinnacle of nonconformity, but he, that's one of the reasons he played electric guitar at that famous festival, because, you know, it was going against the grain because everyone was so entrenched in this. You know, you can't, you have to play acoustic and be, you know, quote unquote true to be like the legitimate, I don't know, whatever hero that they were making Dylan out to be. And he purposely did electric to go against that grain and got in, an insane backlash. Um, yeah, word is uh, Pete Seeger was looking for an axe to cut the electrical cord. Are you serious? He was in a frenzy, and they were trying to get him to calm down, and he was running around looking for an axe. Huh. That's the best part of that whole whole story. Yeah, that's, that is, I never heard that, but that would explain a lot. That's, that's pretty interesting. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, 
I don't know if I have any advice to the hipsters out there. Uh, uh, you know, wear a different color flannel <laughs> than this guy. Um, you know, you gotta you gotta find an original slant on this. So that's my advice. Yeah, is is flannel the new tie dye? Uh, I don't know. You could say going back to the '90s and the whole Kurt Cobain, uh, you know, that whole generation, which we grew up in. Yeah, I'm. am just wondering, is that the the tie dye? I mean, is that like the, <clears throat> you know? Yeah, these days I think it is. Hmm. Or or it's the skinny jeans. Oh, jeez, don't. We're not gonna talk about that now. But I think some. Uh, cutting edge hipster out there might want to make a tie dyed flannel. That's a really good idea. I'd like to see that. And if you make one or have one or see one, take a picture, send it to packets and bolts at gmail.com, and we will uh, make fun of it and have a lot, good time. Okay. I mean, how is that much different from, uh, like, multicolored leisure suits and some of the crazy leisure suits you had in the 70s? I mean, <laughs> that was kind of like the tie-dyed uh, fad of the time. Yeah, I think that was, like, the uh, breaking away from the... It was, like, the non-conforming, um, you know, taking the establishment suit and turning it into, like, a mockery of itself. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Or they just wanted to wear ridiculous things. I don't really know. Okay. So next, I've got a, another. Oh, and I do, you know, we've been hearing some things. We're not, our last story is not going to be about Florida. Just so everyone's aware. We're not going to end on a Florida headline. But um, these next two are kind of related. Um, I wonder, you know, it was a male, female, so they're not directly related. But I, you know, we found a study that affected men, and we wanted to find one that affected women. And I was having a hard time. And luckily, one of our, uh, you know, one of our um, listeners, uh, very resourceful, um, she sent us one. So we got two of these. Now, now these don't surprise me. Well, actually, the, the female one does. This first one um, having to do with men, not surprising at all because I hate this, this stuff, but uh, non-stick frying pans can make your penis smaller, uh, study says. Yeah, now, you, you need to lubricate them before you put your... Like, what is going on here? <laughs> well, according to the study... How, how does a frying pan have anything to do... Non-stick frying pans. It's the uh, PFCs. Um, so I, I stopped using these a long time ago because, you know, they'll, like, kill your bird if you have a yeah. bird. Yep. Um, they are just very toxic. And they can make, uh, if they're overheated too much, they can make a neurotoxin, uh, which the company claims that, that normal household stoves cannot get a pan that hot. But um, they found that it actually can if you leave it sitting there. But... This apparently, I never thought this would happen, but um, a new study found, and this is from uh, New York Post, uh, but a new study found that a chemical commonly found on nonstick pans and fast food wrappers, which that's scary, fast food wrappers, uh, may have a significant impact. Are we talking about like gangster wrappers or like what are, oh, oh fast uh, food. like, yeah, okay, like the papers there, okay. Yeah, on. and that's. Gross. I didn't know that they put this stuff on, on wrappers that your food comes in, but may have a significant impact on endowment and can result in smaller schlongs. I, I don't know why they ended the sentence with impact on endowment and can result in smaller schlongs since it's kind of the, it's kind of redundant. So it's not, it's not just the pans, it's the fast food. I, well, I mean, PFCs are way, they're everywhere and it's really bad. Um, and what's interesting is the research, which took place in Italy, which I didn't know they had as many PFCs as we do here, found that those who had been exposed to uh, perfluoroalkyl compounds, also referred to as PFCs, had significantly smaller eggplants, they call it, than those who hadn't, as well as lower semen count. Now, see, if it was just, uh, you know, penis size alone, I might have a little more... Um, you know, skepticism, but the lower semen count. I mean, obviously, this stuff has effects on on our health. Um, so PFCs. Yeah, so, so I mean, Italy they have just as many like fast food joints as we have here in America, right? I I don't know. I I didn't think I so. Mean, but there's there's obviously a correlation here between fast food and the size of your eggplant. So it could be. 
People need to uh, avoid the fast food. Okay. Yeah, according to the study uh, published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, adult males are more likely to accumulate the chemical in their body for an unknown reason, meaning the chemical could have a larger effect on them than another population. So they studied 383 male high school students, including 212 who had been exposed to PFCs. I, I don't know how they found out what people that didn't get exposed to it. In Northeast right. Italy, through June 2017 and May... They took participants' blood to measure sexual hormones, uh, examined semen samples, and yes, took several measurements um, on their growers, <laughs> including length, circumference, testicular volume, and uh, anogenital distance, also known as, <laughs> as also known as, and this article actually says, uh huh, the Kendall region. Isn't the anal genital, isn't isn't that the taint or or, or the the choda? That's the clinical term for the taint is the Kendall region. Yeah. I, okay. Yes. So, okay, and then it says, uh, and boy, do these chemicals have an effect on boys? Participants who weren't exposed to PFCs had tall boys with an average length of three point nine four inches compared to an average of three point four four inches in those who had exposed. Men were also one fifth of an inch less girthy. I'm, I'm assuming these are all measured flaccid. So you have your tall boys and you have your eggplants. Am I gherkins. Gherkins. Is that what, was <laughs> no, that one of the terms? No, they just use eggplant as a euphemism, but I'm, I'm saying gherkin for the small ones and uh, tall boys for the... Wait, so that's your term? I'm just saying I mean, what they were calling it. They were just calling... Uh, the penis in general an eggplant for some reason, because it's Italy. I don't know. Wait, you... Oh, I got okay. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. I I use cast iron and stainless steel. I'm done with all those nonstick pieces of garbage. Copper is good. Well, yeah, if you have, I mean, I don't know. That's professional stuff. You're the culinary expert. I I wouldn't go that high end. <laughs> yes, I would. I would not buy nonstick. You know, maybe maybe subtle use cases, but uh, do not buy your nonstick pans at the dollar store. Oof. Yeah, Do not buy your nonstick worse. pans at the discount mart that everybody goes to, and they are everywhere um, because it's cheap. Okay, buy quality. Yes, you get what you pay for, but it doesn't take a lot to buy small eggplants. <laughs> That's right. In the form of PCFs, PFCs. So PFCs. Yes. And PCA. Okay, so. <laughs> hey, public service announcement tonight on duopoly oligopoly. Yeah. Be careful where you buy your nonstick pans or don't buy them at all. Right. Cast iron, stainless steel, uh, use some oil, learn how to cook. Um, okay, and then going along with that, so we gave a men health, you know, there's a men's health issue, and we've raised awareness. And now for the women's health, and ladies, we do care about you here at Packets and Bolts. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this one is disturbing to me. Uh, This is off of, um, I'm looking at Collective Evolution, and the title is simple, Ladies Ditch the Bra. There is evidence, some evidence, of a relationship between bras and breast cancer. Okay, collectiveevolution.com here. Okay. Uh, So... Sidney Ross Singer and Soma uh, Grismeyer authored a book called Dress to Kill. They interviewed 4,000 plus women, five major U.S. cities over two years. Half the women had been uh, diagnosed with breast cancer, and they found that 75% of women who slept in their bras developed breast cancer. One in seven who wore bras uh, 12 plus hours a day developed breast cancer. One in 680, or one, sorry, one in... 168, so one in 168 who did not wear a bra developed breast cancer. Okay, so, you know, one in seven versus one in 168. That's a pretty big difference. Within one month of ditching their bras, women with cysts, breast pain, or tenderness found their symptoms disappeared. Uh Uh-huh. This is a no-brainer, folks. Yeah, stop wearing bras. Yep. 
I mean, what guy cares if a woman wears a bra? And if a woman wants to wear a bra, I mean, that's her prerogative. But, but I don't want to hear any excuse. I don't know any man that cares if a woman wears a bra or not. So don't, don't blame us. Not at all, no. I mean, those societal norms, as far as I'm concerned, are gone. Yes. Those, those were put to rest 40, 50 years ago. Amen. Let them breathe. Yes, let them breathe. Freedom, uh, Freedom Friday, was it? And Yeah. So. Uh, Whatever makes you comfortable. This, this goes on, uh, breast size, handedness, and breast cancer risk. Now, I, I, I didn't look at all the details on that, but um, bras and girdles can reduce melatonin levels. So I, I just don't get it. Japanese researchers found that they can lower melatonin by 60%. So melatonin, melatonin has anti-cancer properties. And Spanish, Spanish researchers wrote about the use of melatonin uh, melanonin in breast cancer prevention and treatment. So I don't know. This article's saying melanonin in one sentence and melatonin in another. So I, I don't know if they confuse that. But uh, the point is, if you're really getting a reduction of this uh, chemical by 60%, which is a protective chemical that the body creates by wearing bras and girdles, that's, I don't get it. That's weird. But um, I think, you know, correlation is not equal causation, but these are initial studies. And... Um, the person that gave this to me, she, uh, her boyfriend actually had a theory that, and this is, you know, editorial from uh, her boyfriend, um, but he has a theory, and, you know, maybe someone should fund this study, but he thinks that um, women might have higher uh, causes of cysts and um, what are the other uh, symptoms here other than cancer, but cysts, breast pain, tenderness, they might have higher prevalences of those um, in addition to breast cancer if their breasts are not fondled enough. So, I mean, you know, I think someone should do that study. I think that's a very important woman's health issue. I don't know what you think, Mongoose. No, I would agree. You know, more research, more research is uh, required. So, yeah, I don't know. This is, uh, you know, men's health, women's health. There's a lot of stuff in our society that causes problems. So just saying, at the very least, do not wear a bra to bed. Um, and then it also says that if you're going to wear them, uh, wear loose bras in softer materials and avoid underwires. I would also add to this that you should um, probably go with natural fabrics. That would be my guess, like cotton. But um, I don't know if they make organic cotton bras, but... Um, it also says tight bras and underwear uh, underwires restrict lymphatic drainage. And lymphatic fluid is not very uh, talked about in Western society, but the Eastern traditions talked about a lot. Um, even I think they had a different name for it, but the lymphatic system is a... In, in humans, we don't have a lymphatic heart. Some animals actually do. But our fluid is only moved around by basically body movement. movement. So if you do yoga, it helps lymphatic uh, flow. Um, if you're lethargic, uh, your lymph, your lymph system can, um, stagnate. And that would be very interesting if the bras were causing, uh, lymph fluid to gather and, and basically stagnate and cause this disease in breasts. So yeah, I don't know. Let them, let them hang. Uh, make sure you're getting proper fondling by a qualified technician. Um, and, uh, you know, keep checking those things. Amen. We care about you. Okay, so now remember, Florida is not going to be the last headline, but we do have some headlines dealing with Florida. So this is from uh, WPBF, um, ABC 25 WPBF, Maryland man arrested for tackling brown pelican in Florida. So really, we're not even, this isn't even a Florida problem. This is a Maryland man who decided to go do something stupid in yes, Florida. Yes, these are people invading Florida. Yeah, to do something dumb. So people are giving Florida a bad name. Right. Yeah, so Maryland State Police said uh, in a Friday release that 31-year-old William Hunter Hardesty, <laughs> I don't know where these guys get their names, uh, was arrested at a hotel in Ocean City, Maryland. News outlets report the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission investigated the video of Hardesty trying to capture a brown pelican at Florida's Key West Historic Seaport. 
The video was taken March 5th and posted on Facebook pay, uh, on his Facebook page March 8th. Monroe County State Attorney Dennis Ward told the Miami, Miami Herald the charges amount to five misdemeanors. Hardesty is being held as a fugitive in the Worcester County Detention Center, awaiting extradition to Florida. Reports didn't include comment from Hardesty, who originally who's originally from Anne Arundel County? I don't know, wherever that is. Maryland, I would guess. Now I, I, now, I read this story, and this guy was bragging to all his buddies about tackling a pelican. So, I mean, he, he didn't exactly keep it quiet or try to evade the law. Yeah, and I'm watching the video here, and he lured him with a fish. How cruel is that? I don't know, but I'd like to see this. I'm, I'm, I'm sad they don't have a video about this. It's it's on the uh, WPBF.com site. I will have to put the, po- the yeah, but link. do they show him trying to tackle? A it's got the video right here. He's got it in his hands. He's got him. So he's leaning over the dock with a fish. I'm watching it in real time. And then as the pelican gets here, he just jumps on it. I'm surprised like, the pelican didn't peck him. Does he take it down? He, is this he, guy a football player? He he just jumped on top of it. I think the pelican was stunned because he landed like on him. Maybe even I think his knee hit his head. I think he was stunned. I think the pelican would have bit him otherwise. How big is the pelican? Pretty big. Like I don't even know how big a pelican is. Yeah, they yeah they can get big. I, I'm surprised it's so docile. I think he did hit its head with his knee. So that that's pretty cruel. And so you got to just pelican with a concussion. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. I don't know. You, know. you think after something like that, you'd go into hiding, and this guy goes and he starts bragging. It ser- you know, serves him right. Yep, hopefully justice will be served if they extradite him to Florida. Stick him with the monkeys. Yeah, yeah, they should put him on the they're, island. The herp- they're herpes monkeys. Let them get them. Yeah. That would be a great uh, penal colony. Okay, so now we got another Florida story here. And it's Florida woman named Crystal accused of trafficking crystal meth. Uh So this is off uh, WTSP.com, Channel 10 apparently. Uh, A portion of the meth was found in areas accessible to children in the home, according to deputies. So Homosasa, Florida? Hamasosa? Hamasasa? I don't know. I don't know what's going on here, but a woman named Crystal is accused of selling significant amounts of crystal meth. I, I don't know. Is that a legal term? Significant amounts? Um, Citrus County detectives issued a search warrant early Wednesday morning for a home on a Woodward Place in Hamasasa. Crystal Huggins, Crystal Huggins, uh, 47, was arrested following the search investigation. Deputies say... They had to search through multiple layers of litter and debris inside and out of the home, which had exposed wiring, open septic, and other safety hazards. Hmm. Any uh, surprise there? Probably not. The home reportedly ran power from a generator. It was not power. <laughs> it was not supplied by municipalities. So, <laughs> kind of seems like a mobile uh, meth lab to me. Was it a mobile home? <laughs> um, I'm going to guess yes. I, I do not. I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just skimming some of it. I don't, I don't see it. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a good bet. Powered by a generator. Cooking meth. Well, who knows if she actually made meth. I don't know. She's selling it. Um. Oh, they found drug distribution equipment and meth that was already packaged for sale. Does it really matter if it was packaged? I don't, I don't know. Sometimes I think some of this reporting is kind of giving uh, us... That's, that's how they prove that you got intent to deliver, I think. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> Her name's Crystal. Well, that's, that's wow. enough. Yeah, is that probable cause? Yes. Your name's Crystal? <laughs> I think it is. I think it is. Especially with the Patriot Act. Okay, so... Another Florida story... Remember, it, Florida is not going to be our last, our last headline. Just saying. Okay, so this is uh, Action 
uh, newsjacks.com, CBS 47, Fox 30, Action News Jacks. Um, floor, uh, caught on camera, Florida man licks doorbell continuously. So this is Lake Worth, Florida. Um, so <laughs> I don't know what this is. I haven't investigated this site, but ring.com caught another doorbell licker at a home in Lake Worth, Florida. So I don't know what ring.com is, but do they track doorbell lickers? Or is it a uh, camera company that watches your front door? That's probably what it is, but I don't know. Yeah, no, I mean, Ring, yeah, uh, oh, I almost lost it there. Ring yep. is, is pretty, uh, a pretty well-known um, doorbell camera type company. Ah. They, you can, you have a camera in your doorbell up front. So uh. you see the little picture from that news article there, guys, stooping down to whatever he's doing. <laughs> Um, get ready to lick the camera. It takes pictures. So it's like a security system. Oh, People are big on it. It's got some security concerns that nobody's aware of. Uh, nobody cares about these days. <laughs> but, uh, um, generally a, a pretty big company in the, in the space. Growing interest. And uh, I don't know if these people are targeting this house. If this is just another incident of a doorbell liquor at this home in Lake Worth, Florida. Or if they're just talking that Ring.com catches all sorts of doorbell lickers. I yes. did not realize that doorbell licking was such a big thing in the United States this time in these days. But uh, apparently it is. Yeah. I don't li- I've never licked doorbells. Have you? No, I never got the urge. I mean, maybe I need to get a Ring doorbell and uh, maybe then I'll grow a, a pension for licking doorbells. I yeah, or you'll just find all of the doorbell lickers will be attracted to it. Yes, that's a good experiment. Okay, but maybe this only works in Florida, too. I mean, there's something to be said for Florida. A little bit strange. Yeah, yeah, it's really weird because... Um, so, uh, yeah, like you said, un- caught another doorbell licker, so I don't know how many there are, but the man can be seen uh, standing outside a door, uh, front door with what the company believes to be a stack of newspapers and then leans into the... Ring video doorbell to lick at again and again and again. The man points at the papers in his hands before licking the doorbell again. This is what the sec- could that mean? This is, the se- this is the second time in just over a month. The doorbell service has reported someone licking a doorbell. Wait, okay. wait, but wait, is this the only incident where they were pointing in a newspaper before they did it? Yeah, I don't know. And I'm, I almost have to say that he knew the doorbell was watching him. Or he's just on some drugs and, you know, licking a doorbell seemed like the thing to do. This right. seems like the, uh, some type of, like, uh, plot for a TV show, a cop TV show, where you got a bunch of detectives standing around <laughs> talking about how we're going to get the doorbell licker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I wonder how much of a manhunt's going on for this guy. And uh, they don't really have a good picture of his face, but they should um, they should post that up. So he's still wanted. He's still on the run. <laughs> as far as I'm aware, there's nothing here that says uh, he was caught or identified. So this guy could be a serial doorbell licker. I mean, how many of these right. incidents have been attributed to that guy? Right, but the other question is, is that even illegal? That's true. I don't, I don't even know maybe if it is because if you went up to the door to ring it, it would just be ringing a doorbell. You're just licking it. It's almost like a ring, except you're not ringing it. Unless he pushes it with his tongue. I don't know. So that's, a, that's an interesting legal case right there. It, uh, yeah, he just might be uh, in a loophole here. Yeah. Maybe he thought he was like auditioning for that movie, like The Ring. Like maybe there's a sequel he thought he was going to be in. <laughs> okay. So, last headline: Not Florida. Okay. All right. Foxnews.com. Tennessee man accused of dipping testicles in customer's salsa. Oh. Yep. 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 So, a Tennessee man is accused of dipping something other than chips into a customer's salsa. Howard Webb, 31, was with a driver for Dinner Delivered, a food delivery service, on January 12th when he allegedly put his testicles in an order of salsa that a customer had ordered from a Mexican restaurant in Maryville, uh, WBIR-TV reported. 
um, Webb in a video published by the news station is seen seemingly putting his testicles in a cup of salsa. Someone else in the vid- vehicle, identified as the delivery driver, is heard giggling and saying, this is what you get when you give an 89-cent tip for an almost 30-minute drive. Oh, it feels good on my brackets testicles, Webb replies. <laughs> Brackets testicles? Yes, I guess he didn't actually say testicles. Um, he probably used a uh, expletive or no. eggplant. Eggplants? <laughs> Maybe nuts. I don't. I don't know. I, I didn't listen to the video, but um, tall boy. <laughs> so, I mean, I just gotta say, if you're giving a food delivery service, they don't even work at the restaurant. An eighty-nine cent tip, and if it really is a thirty-minute drive. I almost have to say this isn't a crime. No, this is completely justified. That's kind of ridiculous. Um, when you, if people aren't aware how much you can piss off uh, restaurant workers, um, they should be aware that if you're gonna pay a third-party delivery driver who has no connection or concern for the restaurant that he's delivering for, if you're gonna give them an 89 cent tip, which is actually more of an insult than no tip. And in an actual 30-minute drive, I mean, that's, uh, you're begging for some problems. The only mistake these guys made was publishing it. I mean, there's a lot worse things that people could have done to this food. And this is just a thing of salsa. <laughs> yeah, this this is one documented instance, and how many more undocumented instances are there? Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, this is ramp. Hey, folks, public service announcement number two tonight. You be careful and you respect the people who make your food because shit happens <laughs> in, in the fast food industry. Right. In the delivery industries. It happens. Right. And for those trying to say that we're victim shaming, no one's excusing the behavior of the testicle salsa dipper. Or is it salsa testicle dipper? Anyways, but we're... Also not excusing the behavior of the uh, person that tipped 89 cents for a 30-minute drive. I mean, that's ridiculous. They did wrong. And if you don't realize that you piss people off by doing that, then you probably shouldn't be ordering food from anyone. You should learn how to cook. Go back to our uh, one of our earlier headlines. Learn how to cook. Don't use nonstick pans. Yeah, so let's hope that the guy who dipped his... Uh brackets testicles <laughs> and the salsa just say brackets dipped his brackets in there let's hope he didn't get uh, pfc poisoning or whatever oh yeah right <laughs> yes a direct dose to the johnson <sighs> wow oh well, those That's are something else yeah wow Whew. yeah that was a that was a list crazy headlines yes that was the headlines for march this monday March 18th, 2019, Spring Eve Eve. The Eve of Spring Eve. It's the day before the day before, folks. (laughs) The day before, after tomorrow, before yesterday. Okay, well, that's all the headlines we have. We're going to take a short break uh, to get a word from our sponsor. And then uh, we'll be back with uh, listener emails. I did call it, uh, I just realized in, in listening to our show last uh, last month that I called it user emails. So you can tell that I did work in IT at one point in my life. I'm sorry, they're listeners, not users. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll be back shortly. Ah, yes, the sound of bubbling beans boiling next to a babbling brook. That's pleasant. Hank Carlson here, proprietor of Baked Beans and Books. Did you know April 20th is National Lima Bean Respect Day? Bet you didn't. Even though our wonderful baked beans aren't lima beans, in solidarity to beans of all kinds, we'll be having a special 20% off all baked beans for the month of April. Come on down and enjoy some mouth-wateringly moist baked beans. I made them special myself just for this occasion. As always, we're located at 11111 State Street, 
in Madison, Wisconsin. Baked beans and books, when books just aren't enough. And we're back. This is uh, your host, Muskrat, co-host Mongoose, Packets Yo. and Bolts, episode three, Duopoly Oligopoly, coming to you Monday, March 18th, 2019, on the eve of Spring Eve. Okay, before we get into it, we got our cocktail coming up here, but uh, check in the mailbox, uh, nothing new, but we do have one listener uh, email, um, Buster. Buster. Mm, yes, probably not his, na- his name, but... Buster or Busta? <laughs> Buster, um, right. with a three, if that means anything to you. kind of hoping it'd be Busta Rhymes. <laughs> No, Buster with the number three for E. So I don't know if that was uh, an attempt at leap. Anyways, uh, Buster says um, there is no uh, herpacious. Um, I believe the word you're looking for is herbaceous. And he proceeds to give us the... uh, the dictionary, which if you do a Google search on herbaceous with a B, um, herbaceous adjective of denoting or relating it to herbs in the botanical sense. I, I don't know why they put in the botanical sense in case we were confused with marijuana, maybe? I'm not, I'm not sure. but um, Or herbs for cooking. Who knows? Anyways, the point is, uh, I don't care if the word exists. Herbaceous is exactly the word that needs to exist. Yeah, why would we be scared of herbaceous monkeys? So, I mean, first of all, did we misunderstand this? No, these are herpes monkeys, right? Right. I I think Buster is claiming herbaceous is not a word. I don't don't care. Well, hey, it doesn't matter because we're making it a word. Right (laughs) now, folks, this is our campaign starting to make herbaceous a word. It will get entered into the dictionary as a new word. Right. Words can be entered into the dictionary. Yeah, they're added all the time. English has hey, the herpes, most words of hey, anything. Herpes is rampant these days. Yeah, especially because of this Florida crap. We need a word like herpacious that can adequately describe the epidemic. Right, and English has like more words than anything. I think a couple of years ago it just had its millionth word added to the dictionary. So do we have an etymologist? If someone could, uh, could help us out there... Um, Herpacious. I mean, it makes sense. It's exactly how it sounds. Herpacious. All right. So we're gonna get we're gonna get that word made. <sighs> do we have to write Good. Webster or something? I mean, how do we do this? Petition Webster. A little bit of research for next show, I believe. Okay, we'll get our intern on that. <sighs> okay. Well, anyways, Buster. Uh, tough. It's it's a yeah. Word. Thanks for nothing, pal. Yeah, packets and bolts at gmail dot com. Um, I would really love to get an email during the show. Of course, no one knows when we when we tape and you know, whatever. But it would be really Classi- cool. Classified locations and everything, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And we time shift our recording, so it's never even guaranteed to actually be March eighteenth, two thousand nineteen. It just works out that it really does. Um, we have a unique system that no other podcast uses, but we don't have to go into those details now. Okay, so, uh, cocktail. Oh, you know, it's going to be spring. You know, I'm getting away from the winter drinks. Um, I don't know what you've got cooking up, Mongoose, but I've got an old-fashioned, but it's not a normal old-fashioned. It's not a Wisconsin old-fashioned, um, although I guess it's from a brandy company that's in Wisconsin, so... I suppose by uh, association, you could say it's a Wisconsin old old fashioned. But um, well, for those, but but it's got brandy. It does. Well, it then does. It's Wisconsin. Well, okay. So for those of you who are uh, liquor aficionados, uh, traditional old fashioned is pretty much all booze. A Wisconsin old fashioned, um, while does uh, favor brandy, whether you get a brandy or a uh, whiskey old fashioned Wisconsin, it comes with soda, um, sweet or sour. Uh, but most places do not do that. It's uh, pretty much booze. And um, so this is closer to a traditional old fashioned uh, with a twist. And it is a dark chocolate brandy old fashioned. Now, 
uh, there is an official recipe from the maker of this dark chocolate brandy. Um, and, uh, you know, you can use it if you want. Um, I'll reveal the maker of the brandy at the end here. But uh, you can use it if you want. But I have made some tweaks because um, it's a little... Uh, it's a little... <sighs> Depending how you like your brandy old fashions, uh, it's a little hard on the orange. So, for this dark chocolate brandy old fashioned, you need dark chocolate brandy, and there's only one I know of, but uh, like I said, I'll give you the brand in a little bit. Uh, you need bitters, and of course, uh, there's only one type of bitter that you want to use if, if you can get it uh, Aganastra. Um, and then you need blood orange liqueur. So, I'm using Salerno. Now, uh, Luxardo cherries are also used. However, tonight, this evening, I am foregoing the Luxardo cherries. Um, I just don't want to have uh, the added sweetness. But they are good, and I would do just one cherry, um, and you're supposed to muddle it. But here's what we're going to do. Um, and I did get listener feedback that uh, my mixing was not close enough to the microphone last time. So I think I've improved my setup, but I don't have a lot of room here. So here we go. Now, uh... Again, the official website that has this recipe, um, the ratio was too strong on the blood cherry. So here's what I do. I do 5 or 5.5, or you could even go up to 6 to 1, dark chocolate brandy to blood orange liqueur. Because the blood, or blood orange liqueur is pretty... Uh, it's pretty out there and it does uh, overwhelm the, the taste. So if you really want your dark chocolate to come out, uh, have 5 or 5.5 or 6 to 1 ratio. So here we go here. Okay. Now that is the dark chocolate. Um, now it says a dash of bitters, but if you're like me, uh, you want a lot of bitters. So I always do three, three to four dashes. And then my one part of my uh, blood orange liqueur Salerno here. I don't know if anyone else makes blood orange liqueur. And then you top that off with seltzer. Okay. Stir it up. Mm hmm. That is perfect. That is a perfect dark chocolate brandy old fashioned. And for my dark chocolate brandy of the evening, um, the only one I know of, I'm sure there's others, Drum, but it is. Roll. It is Kohler. Kohler dark chocolate brandy. When you think dark chocolate brandy, think Kohler, as well as sinks and toilets. Okay. That is tasty. Ah, and it does remind me of spring, or at least the eve of spring eve. That does sound good. Mm, yeah, that is good. Now, this is a lot. I put, uh, I put several shots in here so this is going to last me uh how about you mongoose well muskrat the apocalypse is coming so i'm indulging in the company of those mis most prestigious gentlemen otherwise known as the four horsemen oh no <laughs> oh yeah that's jim beam jack daniels johnny walker and jameson oh now are these equal parts oh yeah no, that's four. That's four shots. One point five ounces times four. Oof. That's six ounces of four horsemen goodness, all poured together on the rocks in a slightly chilled lowball glass. But let's be clear, there's nothing classy about it. <laughs> <laughs> Is it on the rocks? Oh yeah. Okay. So you've got six ounces of the apocalypse. Yes. Six. Oh. Six ounces of apocalypse. Oof. Salute. Well, some people, yeah, salute. Mm. Whew. Well, some people make the Four Horsemen with Jose Cuervo, and that's okay. Oof. No. That's that's not a proper Four Horsemen. 
so I didn't know that. I thought uh, so. I thought the three wise men included Jose, and I thought the four horsemen just added off that. Now is Jose included in a three wise men? A proper? Um, I've seen it both ways. Okay, okay. but the four a proper four horsemen is all whiskey or scotch, but oh, that's a or bourbon yeah. or bourbon. But they're all they're all whiskeys. Okay, of various types. Okay, Jose is not a whiskey, and that's Correct. why Jose. Well, does not belong. I don't, I don't know what Jose is, but it's not. It's not even good. They need. They need to build the whiskey wall. Yeah. So give me that. Uh, give me that rundown again. Let's go through these four horsemen. That's right. It's Jim Beam. Mm-hmm. It's Jack Daniels. Mm. Johnny Walker. Oof. And Jameson. Now see Beam and Walker. You know, uh, respectable. Uh, Jamo, I would not mix that with. Any of those, um, Jamo's well, good on its Irish. own. Jamo's good on its own, but yeah, well, yeah, he's gonna he's gonna throw some uh, some punches. And uh, Jack Daniels, man, oh, well, John Daniels. But uh, I mean, I used to drink a ton of that straight back when I was young. But now I've I've just you know me and me and John have fallen out. Just can't yeah, do it. That's that's your Tennessee whiskey, your Jameson's, your Irish whiskey. Yep. Then, uh, what, Jim Beam's your Kentucky bourbon? Is that right? Well, isn't isn't Jack Daniels, um, again, John Daniels, when you know him as good as I do, uh, isn't isn't that a Tennessee bourbon? I, I'd have to look that up. Yeah, I uh, well, I, I, I would classify that as a Tennessee whiskey, but you might be right. I think on the label it says bourbon somewhere, so... <laughs> Yeah, well, Jose Cuervo says tequila, and it's not tequila. Okay, so... Or well, what's the knockoff rum? Uh, San Juan. San Juan. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's bad. I remember that. So it, it even says on the bottle, rum-flavored alcohol. And that's a guy. I mean, you don't see San Juan in any of these drinks here. You can't have Jim Beam, Jack Daniels, Jenny Walker, and then bring in San Juan. Oh. Saint Saint Juan? Oh. No, no, nobody invite, invites uh, Saint Juan to the party. Well, right, and and like I said, it says rum flavored alcohol. So if you had your tequila saying you know tequila flavored alcohol, the thing is, at least to be to be fair to Jose, uh, to be called tequila, it has to be. Uh, now I'm kind of forgetting. It. It's either fifty or fifty one percent, you know, blue agave. So it has to at least be that. But the point is, I found out a long time ago that those low-end tequilas are not good for me. So I, uh, if I drink tequila, it's got to be 100% blue agave, because otherwise it just tastes like vodka with a little bit of, little bit of something in it, and it's not good. Okay. So wow, that's some that's some top shelf uh, stuff there, Muskrat. Uh, blue agave is all you'll drink. If it's tequila, it's got to be 100%. I can't do I can't do you, those low. You ends. won't drink. You won't drink Patron. Well, Patron is 100% blue agave, but it's not uh, its not aged. The normal Patron is not aged. I like uh, aged tequila. So, you know, Patron's all right, but it, it doesn't really have any flavor. So I like the uh, Nejo, you know, oh, it's, it's Don smooth, Julio. Though. That's oh, smooth. yeah, it is smooth. It is smooth. But uh, but uh, Jose Cuervo, not, not smooth. Uh, of course, they have Cuervo Gold, which I guess is 100% blue agave, but I don't know. Well, I think we've prepped ourselves pretty good here. We've got uh, we got our spring drink. Um, we've gone through um, probably half the headlines in existence. We've done male and uh, men and female health. Um, I think we're ready to talk about the duopoly oligopoly, which, again, the show is uh, about technology, life, philosophy, and everything in between. So this is not strictly a technology topic. Although uh, technology can play a part in helping us, um, as well as hindering us. But um, the issue is, uh, for those that have not decoded the meaning of the title of this show, uh, duopoly um, is like monopoly, but with two instead of one. And oligopoly is like a monopoly, but defined as limited competition, um, so you could say saying uh, duopoly oligopoly is a redundant uh, statement, but the point is uh, our system of electoral, uh, uh, you know, elections is really forcing us 
into a two-party system whether we want it or not. And I find it really interesting, by the way, that um, there's so much talk today in the news about antitrust mm. one way or another, you know, and, you know, companies get too big. The government wants to fracture them up, create more competition. Well, why is there no antitrust laws related to the political parties? Hmm. Why do we always have two parties? And then occasionally you get a little bit of talk about a Green Party or, you know, uh, I mean, what are, what are some of the other well, smaller ones we've had? But, yeah, I mean, the Constitution Party, the Libertarian Party. Um, yeah, well, of course. The of only course, time but we... Which, but how many of them get actually, actually get notoriety and you get a candidate running that actually yeah. makes headlines? Yeah, yeah. No, no, it is tough. And the, the thing is, uh, historically... Um, there's been changes in our party system, but it usually comes as pretty much, you know, replacing one of the two parties. Um, so, what was it? The Federalists and the, um, uh, oh, what's the other one? Back in the, the early days of the Republic. Um, it was, you know, Tom, uh, Jefferson and... Um, well, Jefferson and Hamilton were both Federalists, technically. Yeah, but then and the party John split. Adams, who he was... Um, he was the other side, and I can't believe. Yeah, I'm well, that, that was the Federalist and Anti-Federalist, plain and simple. Um, but those were more ideologies. But the Federalists became a party, and then there was the Republican Democrats or Democratic yeah. Republicans, excuse me. Yeah. And so that's what you yeah. had early on. But and then the Whigs and all that, and and these guys just replaced basically. They ended up just replacing, um, you know, one of the other big guys. So. We, our system, you know, uh, for all the forethought that the Founding Fathers had, they did not, Washington saw it. It's actually one of the reasons he ran for a second term was to stave off the formation of the uh, parties. Um, he probably wouldn't have ran for a second term if he didn't see this coming. So that was probably the biggest uh, blunder in the Founding Fathers' uh, creation of our republic is not thinking about how to prevent, you know, just two major, you know, back and forth you know, ping pong politics, right? So in Europe, they developed the parliamentary system, which had um, uh, proportional representation. And, you know, we're going to get into some of the solutions, but before, you know, I, we'll just mention proportional representation. But um, in terms of what the problem is, uh, what, why is a duopoly, oligopoly such a problem, Mongoose? Well, before we get into that, I mean, just a, just another word on political party history. So, you know, it's something I want to call out and something I found interesting. Anybody who's familiar with American history, in 1835, the French observer Alexis de Tocqueville published his essay, Democracy in America, and he noted that the U.S. was divided between two opinions, which are as old as the world, one tending to limit, the other to extend indefinitely the power of the people. And so ever since the 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 inception of the United States of America, you've always had this kind of yin yang effect, okay? And so some of it's ideological um, in its roots, but you know if if you look at the different phases of American history, post American Revolution, you had federal power versus state sovereignty, and that's kind of where that federalist versus anti federalist type of mentality came in in the early 1800s. It was limitation versus the extension of the power of the people, and how. Far, how, how powerful should we let people become and how powerful should the state become in their, their attempts to govern them? You know, and then mm. in the antebellum years, it was industry versus an, agra an agrarian society. That was when it was north versus south. And, you know, it was still federal versus states rights. Uh, but, you know, pre-Civil War, you had abolition versus slavery. So we see politics starting to take more of a humanitarian bent in that respect. And so, you know, on and on, I'm not going to paint the whole entire picture of the United States history, but a lot of the, the things that we talk about today that differentiate the two parties have underpinnings in, in some of the, uh, the themes that we've seen throughout American history. But the bottom line is, are we not mature enough as a, as a nation 250 years or, you know, 200 years later? Mm. Um, you know, that, that we can start thinking in, in multiple facets because let, let's be realistic right now. We have two parties and in this, in this show, we're not going to be lambasting any one of the two. We're not going to say that, Hey, the Democrats are right. And the Republicans are wrong. And we're not going to say the Republicans are right. And the Democrats are wrong, but just taking a look at this thing and stepping back as a whole, we have two parties that in a lot of 
respects are have a similar train of thought. Um, but there's a lot of different, you know, counterpoints. Uh, they lie at two ends of a different spectrum. You know, it might be rich versus poor. It might be, um, you know, commercialism, uh, capitalism versus, you know, unionism. You know, it may right. be women's rights versus not. And so we see some of those things. And there, there's a lot of them, a lot of stark contrast. But uh, mm. ultimately, when it comes down to voting, do you identify 100 percent with one of the parties versus the other? Because mm. I know I don't, because I know that when I sit down and I think about it, I have a very complicated political dynamic, uh, you know, a set of feelings about different things. And I find my views split between the parties. And right. is that really practical when you have to oftentimes vote for the lesser of two evils? Mm -hmm. I mean, instead of continuing to bicker about the lesser of two evils and pointing fingers at that other party that you don't affiliate with as much, um, perhaps it's time we all take a step back and start rethinking the system. Why are we stuck with two parties and what are the alternatives? Right. And I, I think part of this uh, story has to do with the fact that the, the parties in power make the laws and it is very difficult to jump in <clears throat> as a new party and try to get uh, your name on the ballot. You know, ballot access is crazy. Yeah. And right now there's I think part of the crux of the problem is the system of voting. Um, you get one vote. Mm. And a lot of people are concerned about spending that one vote on a party that most oftentimes doesn't have a shot of winning or having any positive yeah. impact whatsoever on the process. Right, like their ideal candidate they uh, don't think has any chance of winning. And part of the reason, to be honest, that they don't have a chance of winning is, like, let's say you get a popular candidate. Well, a popular candidate in theory like, um, like you know, Ralph Nader uh, during the 2000 election. So you, you get this term spoiler, which I, I don't personally like because, uh, you know, it's our right to vote for anyone. So, you know, to use the term spoiler, is a, it's like shutting down debate. It's, it's just a way to, to stop people from talking about something. But um, you get a, a person like Ralph Nader who it was very well known. He was not publicized during his campaign. He was filling stadiums with 30,000-some people. You know, Pearl Jam was playing at stuff. He, he filled Madison Square Garden. So you've got the, the popularity. But enough people, even with that popularity, think not enough other people are going to vote for this person that I should maybe not vote for this person. This is the dilemma that we have. So there's several solutions, and, and we'll get into that soon, but just to recap here the dilemma, having two, a, a two-party a two winner-take-all system like we have, part of the issue is you, it's really hard to vote for an ideal candidate. It's, it's hard to go out on a limb for someone. You pretty much have to know the person is going to be a winner for you to vote, which really stifles the ability to have any type of wiggle room in ideolo ideology. Um, that's that's the biggest problem that I see with it, and and these two parties vie for control, uh, in in Wisconsin here. You know, uh, let's talk about uh, the systems of power that that stagnate power. Uh, you know, people talk about term limits. I'm actually not personally in favor of term limits because they don't address the root cause of the problem, which is, uh, you know, non-competitive seats. You know, we should be able to vote these people out. But when you get an incumbent that just keeps running for, you know, 80 years and, you know, he comes out of his crypt every so often to vote, he, you know, he can't be defeated. And the reason is because the gerrymandered district, districts and both sides, you know, left and right, if you can even call them left, right, I, I think neocons and neoliberals are the majority of our uh, politicians these days. And uh, those people are pretty much on the same side of the spectrum. Um Maybe some of the new candidates are, are going a different path. But the point is, they they write these laws to make gerrymandering, uh, uh, you know, or gerrymandering, uh, you know, prevalent. And, and I was really mad when we had the ability, you know, over 10 years ago to change that. Because in theory, the Democrats are for fair redistricting, right? But guess what? They were in control and they didn't change it. Uh, 
then the Republicans take over, and they definitely don't want to change it. Uh, now, with the change in governor, he's talking about changing it. Of course, the Republicans aren't going to go along with that. But I worry, what if the Democrats do take back control? Will they really go for that change to do independent redistricting? Because I think that is step one to getting somewhat control over our actual politicians. Well, that, that, that whole system of gerrymandering is just reinforcing the existing system. And, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, there's been a lot of spin over the last years that the Democrats are fair for redistricting. But like you pointed out, it, it's, uh, you know, it's the same. Uh, nobody wants to get rid of it. It's, it's keeping them in office. The system itself, the two-party system, keeps them in office. I mean, ultimately, you go through a primary, and then you have two candidates vying it out, and once you win, you're in office for a few years. I mean, you know, some of these things are probably contributing to some of the corruption that we see with, you know, um, the lobbying uh, industry and uh, some of the lobbyists and, and all the, you know, the, the under-the-table back office type of money that um, are being made in these deals and, uh, you know, writer bills and things. So... Um, mm. Ultimately, to, to drain the swamp, as they say, that's that's another reason that we should be looking at a way to perhaps broaden the political spectrum and start stepping away from something we're so entrenched with, like two party systems and move towards something right. um, more like a ranked choice. Right? Yes. Right, Muscat? No. no, that's right, Mongo. So we're getting to some real solutions. But before we go down that, I'm just I just got to say that the redistricting, you know, if we have fair redistricting, that solves a huge part of the problem. It doesn't doesn't solve the two-party, you know, duopoly, oligopoly. It What it does is it allows you to elect a person that's more in touch with you. Because when you have, in my opinion, with the gerrymandering that we've got, whether it's Democrat or Republican, they're in safe seats. It is so hard to challenge an incumbent in our current setup. So even if you want to try the third party or if you want to primary your incumbent, it is so much harder with our gerrymandered side because it's going to be straight up blue, straight up red. Very few competitive districts. When you have competitive districts, it makes it easier to put people in charge that have accountability to you instead of the donor class. So I still think uh, redistricting reform is a big one, and there's some technology that can maybe help us with that. Um, there's a guy that has an open source program, and we can talk about that. But, okay, ranked choice voting, which I think... Ranked choice voting came out of, I, I believe, well, I don't, I don't know where it started. Maybe, maybe you know. But uniquely, ranked choice voting can help our feebled, our enfeebled system because something like proportional representation, which we can talk about, which is basically the way that uh, Europe and, and a lot of parliamentary systems avoid this problem, um, it would take a lot more changes to get proportional representation. We're talking about amendments, etc. Maine instituted ranked choice voting with a vote, with just a bill. Now, now the, they tried to stop it. These politicians don't want it. Don't give me, make no mistake, Democrats and Republicans both do not want these reforms. But the Republicans were more vocal um, at this point because they, uh, they had the most to lose at this point. But uh, don't think that all these uh, corporate Democrats are going to be in favor of this stuff. And they challenged it. And I, I don't know the full, uh, I can't go through the full history now because uh, I'm actually forgetting parts of it. But basically what happened was, even though it was passed by referendum, okay, so, so this should be a mistake to most politicians when the popular, the popular vote of people in your state vote for something and then you work to try to undermine it. Um, so they went to reverse the, the ranked choice voting and the people had to go out and... Uh, I can't remember how it went down, but it was in winter, and they had to basically do another vote, and the they were able to keep it. And there were law challenges, and it was it was upheld, and then there was an election, and so the first ranked choice election that I know of in the United States was held last, uh, you know, for actual um, seats in there. And what you do if if you don't know how ranked choice vote works, I, and I. And I don't know, Mongoose, if you know the, the exact details in terms of how many choices you get. But let's say you get three in Maine. I, I don't know if it's three or uh, five. It, it depends on the ballot. Okay. So you, you get to rank your first choice, second choice, third choice, etc. 
And if right. your first choice doesn't get f over 50%, you know, if your first choice doesn't win, that vote goes to your second choice. And it keeps going down the ladder until one of your votes wins. Or, you know, whoever it is. It's not, it's not you specifically. It's everyone that voted for number one, right? Their number ones are added up. And if that person doesn't get 50% or I mean, over 50%, it goes to the next and next and next. And so until someone wins. And that solves almost all the problems of the spoiler effect, quote unquote. Um, you know, it lets you do a third party vote easily, right? Like, let's put your ideal candidate, Mr. Libertarian Joe or, you know, Socialist Sue. You put that number one, right? And then, uh, then you put a uh, little more, you know, boring Betty um, and stagnant Sam, right? That's number two. And then, and then you go down to, you know, corporate Democrat Corey and. And I don't know what <laughs> I don't know yeah. what the Republican side. Right. Is. So, so like it's important to point out that as this goes through, the the bottom candidate gets eliminated if no candidate has fifty percent plus one. Um, and then anyone who voted for that candidate in the first place, those votes are now attributed to their second place. Okay. Yes. So that's how it works. And as you go along, those other candidates um, get whittled off from the bottom. Now, it, it's it's important to note that. Um, Ranked choice voting has been popular on a municipal level for many years across the country, and there's been some elections that have gone 14 runoff rounds before a victor was actually declared with that 50% plus one voting threshold. Um, but the important thing is it, it, there's a lot of advantages that we can see here from this type of system. Um, for instance, it encourages voter turnout. A study of 79 elections in 26 American cities found that ranked choice voting was associated with a 10% increase in voter turnout compared with non-ranked choice voting primary and runoff elections. It's partially due to the fact that there are no more wasted votes and that every vote counts in some respect, no matter mm -hmm. what your preference is. Um, yep. it, sh it shifts incentives away from negative campaigning because candidates, aside from attaining first place votes, they're also trying to win as many second and third place votes as possible. Yes. And there's no better way to alienate their constituency or the voters, that, for that matter, than to run a negative campaign. So it gets more positive, which we could certainly use more of that in our elections. Um, smooth and inexpensive implementation. You know, detractors would point to voter confusion and um, I think that's merely a paradigm. Um, the, the, the main voting system proved um, that there were a few issues, but in some respects, actually, if you look at the San Francisco gubernatorial primary vote last year, that vote saw eight times as many errors using plurality voting methods compared to the city's mm. mayoral elections, which use range choice votes. So there is evidence to suggest that the ranked choice voting method is actually mm. more intuitive to voters, and just because it's new, some of those right. errors we see, which aren't major, um, would go away. So any of the detractors saying that this is error-prone, that it's confusing, I think there's a lot of evidence to uh, to argue with that. Mm -hmm. right, yeah, and let's just... Uh, well, okay, so just uh, I believe Maine is the only state that enacted ranked choice statewide. But ranked choice is in other municipalities, right? So the San Francisco you were talking about, um, they do it for certain elections, right? Is that well, right? and like I said, in San Francisco, the, the gubernatorial primary vote. So I don't know if California has it broken up to where there's different voting methods depending on district or deponent, you know, municipal. But this this was a governor vote, a primary vote last year where yeah, but not well, statewide. Actually, that, yeah, that was the plurality vote. Excuse me. So yeah, this we're talking municipal. Mayor, public. and you were talking yeah. about mayor though. Yeah. Yep, yep, so yep. there's there's other municipalities that have Im implemented ranked choice. Maine was the big victory for a state to have ranked choice. Right. There's a lot of people talking about bringing ranked choice vote to the national level. And according mm -hmm. to an article in the Boston Globe on December 4th, 2018, they think that ranked choice vote could work for presidential elections, but not until the Electoral College is abolished. Yeah. Well, that's getting taken care of uh, state by state by the uh, national, uh, uh, what is it called? The... Uh, the NPVIC, yes, the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Yes, where states agree to basically throw their electoral votes to anyone with uh, the, the majority, you know, the plurality of the popular vote. And uh, it is enacted once enough states 
sign up to equal the 270 uh, electoral votes that are needed to win. So yep. they need about, I don't know, depends on the states, but like what, seven to 10 or so states need to sign up, I think still. Well, well, as of this month, it's been adopted by 11 states and the District of Columbia that accounts for 172 electoral votes. And that's about 63.7% of the 270 votes needed for a presidential victory. So it's yeah. making headway. And um, yep. actually, this is the most natural course to abolish the Electoral College. And I'm completely yeah. in favor. Yes. And, and uh, for all the weaknesses that the Founding Fathers had, one strength and also weakness, you could say, you could argue both, is that they gave a lot of powers to the states on how they actually conduct elections. And in the past, of course, it was used for you know Jim Crow laws, et cetera, right? But it could be the way to put reform in control of the people rather than having a constitutional amendment, which would take, you know, a crazy amount of uh, support. Now, the, the only thing that's missing, and, you know, what's telling about all of these fixes to our system is how much politicians don't want to do them. So, so here's another clue. Uh, public service announcement uh, for everyone. If that's both parties... Tonight. If both parties agree on something, we probably shouldn't do it. Just saying. Uh, so, first of all, a lot of these people don't like rank choice. Um, like I said, I mean, the Republicans are more vocal right now, but don't don't think that all the, that all the Democrats are in favor of this because they know that this could open the door to third parties. Um, but you know what else people didn't want to do? Uh, before rank choice voting ever came about, I believe in the 90s, well, I think it goes back to even before that, and, of course, um, was it Baxter or Brewster's Millions, if you remember that movie? None of the above. So the None of the Above initiative has never, it's always been a non-starter. And the idea of None of the Above is if you don't like any of the candidates, you vote None of the Above, and if that, if that gets a, a certain amount of the population, well, I think, I think if it gets like 50 or whatever, then you have to throw out the election, have a new election, and no one that participated in the election can run again. I mean, for the next one at least. That so is brilliant. That, that is awesome. And I would love to add it to the ring choice. <laughs> if you were really so pissed off that you couldn't vote for anyone, even with ring choice, <laughs> that'd be awesome. Agreed. Yep. Yeah. Just think about that. They, you reject everyone running on the ballot, and none of those people could run in the next election. Like, you'd have another special election, and they could not participate. That would be amazing. Like, what a slap in the face. Like, these politicians, you know... Congress has, like, an all-time low approval rating, right? Yet they get elected. Can you picture the slap in the face of being told that they don't want to vote for you or anyone else on the ballot? <laughs> how, how bad would you have to be? And I think as um, voter disaffection increases, I would expect that you would get more not, none of the above answers on your ballot. Yeah. Right. Um, just just as kind of a uh, reflection of what people think about the political order exactly. in general. So it may not be representative of that candidate at all uh, exactly. or that set of candidates. Exactly. And I think that's what they're afraid of. <laughs> they don't want to say they don't want on a ballot to represent how hated they are. And they, they know they're hated. They don't want it to be like, you know, recorded, <laughs> documented. Yeah, but they also don't want to lose their seat just well, right. because, you know, yes. so, I mean, you're giving Power. people a voice there. I mean, people, these politicians will do everything they can to maintain their their seat, you know, with their com comfortable lodgings, their millions <laughs> yeah. of dollars salary, yeah. their... Well, their, they don't get that much money from the government. They get that from the lobbyists. Well, it's, yeah, it's all the handouts. <laughs> I mean, you lose yeah. your access to those lobbyists if you don't have political uh, leverage, so... Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. The revolving door, all that crap. So... Okay, ranked choice voting, one, and, and a great one. And probably for our system, uniquely tailored to fixing our system is probably ranked choice voting. A personal favorite of mine that I, I think would be nice to implement in our House of Representatives and any state that has a bicameral legislator like Wisconsin, um, I think doing the assembly, like Wisconsin, ha you know, our assembly is like the um, House of Representatives at the national level. Mm-hmm. I think proportional representation would be that. So for those that don't know how that works, and Mongoose, you can elaborate, but a quick overview is, you know, let's say you vote for the governor or the president. The percentage of vote to each party is assigned seats in that house. 
So that's how they do it in, in Europe, right, for, uh, for prime minister. And so if, if 10% vote for the Green Party, 10% Green Party gets filled in the, in the House, if t- uh, 20% for the, you know, some other third party, they get put in the House. And then, you know, Democrats might have 30% and Republicans have, you know, 30%. So now you've got this coalition and they have to form, you know, they have to agree with each other to form that coalition, right? And that helps with cooperation, because instead of having, you know, what do we have now? Uh, like, you know, near, well, I don't know what the house is now, but it's like, you know, it's usually near deadlock, uh, gridlock. Uh, in the Senate, it's almost 50-50. But instead of having that, you'd have like, you know, 10%, 20%, uh, you know, 30%, and uh, uh, 40% or something, right? So to get anything passed... You have to make deals and form coalitions with other groups. And who you align with, they're going to hold your feet to the fire, right? Because if they, if they don't like what's going on, they're not going to, you know, cooperate with you, right? So I like proportional representation. And, and that came out after the Constitution of the United States. So that was kind of like, you know, we were like, we were like beta. Well, maybe, we, maybe you could argue that the, the Constitution was the, the alpha. Well... I suppose I suppose the Articles of Confederation were the, our alpha code, <laughs> and that didn't last long. So the Constitution, I, I think we're running on beta code. And the Europeans took it and created a, a, a more refined system that, you know, a lot of studies have found led to more democracy than in the United States. I well, know, let's just look at, look at some of the countries that are doing it right now. I mean, proportional representation, uh, representation systems are in Belgium, Denmark, Finland, Greece, Hungary, Israel... Italy, Luxembourg, Norway, Spain, Sweden, <laughs> Switzerland, and Russia. Uh huh. Yeah. Yes, and Russia. <laughs> and Russia. Well, yeah. Yeah. I left that one to the end. <laughs> yeah, and what about and 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 they've got. But, but a lot of those countries are doing quite well. And mm-hmm. if you look at the uh, you know the World Health Organization statistics of the last couple of years. Um, some of these countries are far ahead of the United States in terms of longevity, like, you know, citizen happiness. Yeah. And you know, we're talking about like state, uh, countries like Belgium, Denmark, Finland. Um, you know, so there could be something to be said about this type of thing. But let's note that there is also a, an overlap here between proportional representation and ranked choice voting. Mm-hmm. There's actually different types of proportional representational systems. There's party list voting, which is where parties provide a list of candidates equal to the number of seats, and then that number of seats is occupied proportional to the popular vote. So those parties identify their candidates ahead of time to fill that complete role, that roll call, and then they're actually elected based on the proportion like you talked about. There's a mixed member proportional voting method where you have a mix of plurality voting and a mix of party list voting. So plurality voting, again, where it's winner take all, one vote, um, but you have a mix. And then there's the single transferable vote or also called choice voting. That's essentially the ranked choice system. You know, So there is a direct correlation between ranked choice voting and proportional representation. Yeah, well, there, there you go. Then then all these solutions exist and we have our head in the sands because guess what we're taught in school? America is the most democratic democracy ever created. Yeah, it's interesting when people talk about rate choice voting too. I've read some things where the legal there is a legal challenge to that system saying that it violates the tenet of yeah, one yes, vote per person. Yes, it's so bad. Yeah. But that's blatantly I I, bullshit. Oh, exactly. Because if you talk about one person having one voice, that voice can be more complex than just a single vote. <laughs> right. It's it's still one vote. You only exactly. get one vote. It, it just depends on whether your vote, you know, is heard. And we do so much in, in the United States. We're, we're not even touching the subject of voter suppression, which we have a shit ton of. We suppress votes, you know... We suppress 50,000 votes before breakfast in this country, <laughs> and we don't care. And, and we think, you know, in, in the name of preventing uh, voter fraud, 
which, you know, uh, imperson- voter imp- impersonation is one of the least offended crimes in existence. And in the name of uh, preventing voter fraud by impersonation, we will suppress millions of votes nationwide. I mean, look at the elections that are happening all over the place with uh, people being turned away from the polls, people uh, removing polls from uh, crowded urban districts where there is minority voters, you know, because the, the Supreme Court somehow overruled, you know, overturned the Voting Rights Act, which which said basically racism doesn't exist and the Congress would have to pass a new law for it to be valid, which, you know, don't, you know, they talk about uh, judicial um, activism. I just want to know how the Supreme Court can say that, well, we, we, we see that this law was valid in the 60s. But, you know, you can't have a law that's valid from the 60s all the way to 2000, you know, whatever. You just got to pass a new law every once in a while. Well, when has that ever been a criteria for what, when? I don't even know. That's probably one of the most blatant judicial activism rules ever. So after they, they invalidate parts of the Voter, uh, Voter Rights Act... Um, uh, and they said that they would have to like pass it again to be updated for our modern days, uh, which of course with our modern Congress they can't do. Then immediately they started to remove polls from urban districts with minority vo- voters and all this stuff. So we are in the definition of a duopoly oligopoly, and the oligarchs are in control. And why do you think so many people hate Congress? Because they're fed the diet they're fed they're basically the the united states voter is a prisoner tied down strapped into a chair force fed the diet of bullshit uh corporate democrat that you see on cnn and fox news and every other station corporate democrat uh corporate republican uh well neocons and neoliberal uh you know donor class endorsed generic GMO processed shit and all of this and it's it's full of PFCs all yeah all of this will expose to PFCs and there's a hole in the seat where their nuts are pulled by some sort of medieval contraption and dipped in salsa salsa is at the bottom of the pit so (laughs) why does the American voter put up with this um, they're resorting to, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, obviously, every day, okay, everybody's bickering on Facebook or bickering on one social media platform or another, Democrats versus Republicans. But meanwhile, they are subverting the American voter, okay? Yes. Some of it's blatant, some of it's obvious, just like you talked about. What about, but what, but what about things like voter machine security? Oh, okay? oh. what kind Isn't of voting there... machine? The electronic voting machine? <laughs> yes. Well, it's not the paper one. <laughs> I'd, be all, I'd be all in favor of going back to the paper ballots, but hey, this is the information age, and you know why? Why uh, we have the, these big electronic election systems that everybody knows, you know, and you have security companies coming out and telling the vendors and telling the 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 polling regents or whoever, you know, the the electoral commission, whatever the case may be, they're being told that these these systems have been proven to be insecure, making recommendations on how to secure them, but nobody's doing anything about it. And then we blame and we point the finger at Russia. Well, look, like according to articles in Dark Reading and other news sources, voting systems in 21 states were probed by Russia in the 2016 presidential election. But I'll tell you, we had enough knowledge that this could happen months in advance of the election and nobody did anything. Some of these machines were running on outdated OSs <laughs> that are known to be exploitable. They're internet facing. Wait, wait, um, wait! Whoa, whoa, whoa! Voting? What? What voting machines are internet facing? Well, <laughs> that I have not heard. Yes, some of them are. Some of them are, and I don't have any specific uh, news hmm. articles right now. But we'll publish some more to our website later. I'm telling you, they're there. Yeah, that would be a really big mistake. You know, last last year's DEF CON conference featured whole village exhibits dedicated to hacking voting systems. Mm-hmm. One hacker yeah. spent four hours attacking a legit copy of the state of Ohio's voter registration rule, and he was only denied because he couldn't write the SQL query to extract the data from the secure database. But that's because he didn't have his notes, okay? <laughs> this is off the cuff. I mean, imagine what a nation state can do if a conference attendee can get that far. 
Well, hey, do you remember the, well, I don't, so I don't know, I haven't kept up on all of the voting mas- machine, uh, the electronic voting machine security. I know it's bad, but do you remember the original Gen 1? Diebold, Diebold, whatever. Uh, they use an access database, which I'm sorry. And, you know, for some of our listeners that aren't technical, you know, you're not going to care what we're talking about, but access database for a voting system oh my i don't even know what to when i heard that back in like what was it 2000 whatever the hell it was i was like who the hell who who actually uses who the access fuck, databases anymore anyway who the fuck well who the fuck allows an access database pardon my french um to to record votes in the quote unquote greatest democracy in the world who so to me the Diebold system back then, I, I believe they're still in the voting machine game, but to me it seemed like a uh, like a like a high school senior slash freshman year, you know, visual basic programmer, uh, you know, midterm project. Can you create a voting system? Well, yeah, I can. I can do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and 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 from what I remember. Okay, so I'm going back a while. I should have looked this up before, but um, I didn't think we'd talk too much about the, uh, especially the old technology. And I, you know what? It could be the same now. But the, the I remember the original, one of the, the original gripes of the Diebold systems was that I believe they didn't use auto numbers in the, uh, in the field. So that if you hack the database, which, you know, it's access database. It's not like it's, you know, it's not like it's Fort Knox. Um, you can modify, you know, you can make any changes to the database and renumber everything because it wasn't using auto-generated uh, numbers in the in the field. You know, like when you create a new column. So, like, in, in if you had auto-number generating and, and you didn't, like, and there was no way to exploit the program. I mean, obviously, if you if you found a bug in the program that could change it, you could you could modify that. But let's say it operated normally and you go and delete a, a, a record or add or add or delete a record the number would be there so you know if you create like a blank record you'd have this number you know you know 1810 and it would have no data and then people would say that's an anomaly well if you have no auto number generation you can there was like a field that you could put your own number in so let's say you you hack the database and it's numbered, you know, one, two, three, four, five, but they're all user generated. You could insert, delete, you know, whatever records and renumber them yourself because they were all fields you had access to. That's like that's like security and you know, we don't we haven't had a show strictly based on application security or database security, but we should. This is like 101. This is shit you learn if you care anything about security. Like you don't have to be a security expert. You don't have to be a CISSP. And you know, to be honest, CISSPs don't really learn about coding practices. But you know, like any decent professor would tell you that you don't you don't put an important database with uh with with the un- unique you know numeric ID of each record. You don't make that only user defined. You make that auto generated so that you if you, there's an anomaly, you see it. So this is the quality of software that George Bush had with his cronies, because I believe he was connected somehow to the Diebold Corporation. Side note, I was in training back around those days, and a guy from Diebold was in my training class for a firewall, uh, I believe it was a firewall security class. (laughs) And I tried bringing up that access database problem, because he was talking about how everyone freaked out about the Diebold security, and they were so good. Those those. Those systems had no problems, he said to me. And I, I, I kind of, you know, I didn't want to, like, start an argument. I just said something about the access database, and he said, I don't know anything about that. So, you know, he, he dodged the question. But the point is, this is the quality of shit that happens in our democracy. And I just thought to myself, I could create a visual basic application that, cre- that tabulated votes, and it would be more secure than this company. And I think they got, you know, millions and millions of dollars for creating that. So what's up with that, Mongoose? I think we missed our calling. Yeah, I think we're out lots of money. I mean, the next Powerball drawing is Wednesday, and I got my <laughs> ticket. But um, I don't know if we're going to be getting rich off of voting machine security. We could. <laughs> we still could, but nobody's listening. Muskrat. No, no Nobody's cares. listening. 
Um, again, we got voting machines everywhere that security experts are coming out of the woodwork and they're saying, look, these need to be repaired. They're making valid, practical recommendations about next steps for securing this infrastructure. And now we're not just talking about voting machines. We're talking about electoral systems and no one is listening. OK, I mm. mean, they they claim that it's related to state municipal budgets that these governments don't have enough to secure the systems that is not a priority but <laughs> don't have enough to bigger, secure it what is a bigger priority in america than securing and improving our democratic voice okay yeah. so i think step 1 and here's my list of next steps step 1 people need to take a step back from the finger pointing that we see in this two party system mm. and take a look at all the problems. The duopoly oligopoly. That are going, the duopoly oligopoly. Okay. We have we have an insecure, easily compromised, whether it be from within or without, whether it be Russia or from the two party system cronies that don't want to give up their seats, we can't secure our voting infrastructure, so our voice is compromised. Um, we have a two-party system which just proliferates the existing problems we're we're continually voting for the lesser of two evils and take a step back folks why why are we doing that okay so mm -hmm. those are the two big questions today there's two things to think about duopoly oligopoly well you know the voting machines <laughs> Here's another 101. So let's let's screw all the internal problems with voting machines. Why do they not print out a paper receipt? It's obviously so that they can hack and manipulate elections. I'm I mean, what other reason is there for not creating a paper receipt? Well, here's a story for you. I was going to put it in the headlines, but since it pertains to our uh, uh, discussion here, I put it in the uh, topic here. Okay, motherboard.vice.com. DARPA, so anyone that doesn't know about DARPA, uh, um, Advanced Research Projects, uh, but it's, that's ARPA, but Defense Advanced Research, Research Projects Agency. So DARPA, who invented, you know, helped to invent the internet, um, uh, cite another tangent here, um, there was a talk show host, uh, Public Radio, which I, I have a lot of respect for public radio, but in this case, the host was a little bit out of her element, I guess. They were talking about the internet, and someone had, a caller had called in talking about how DARPA, you know, created the internet, and she acted like it was a conspiracy theory. I said, that's not true, is it? Anyway, <laughs> anyways, yes, DARPA. DARPA is what helped to create the internet. Anyways, so... No, it was Al Gore. Well, Al Gore, okay. <sighs> Another tangent. Al Gore never said he created the internet, which hopefully mongoose, I don't have to remind you. He it was, it was man bear pig. He, <laughs> let's get cereal here. Okay, El Gore helped to uh, spread the internet's um, influence. Uh, oh, that's probably a bad way of putting it. He helped to open up legislation to make the uh, internet spread. But okay, DARPA is building a $10 million open source secure voting system. The only part of this story that makes me feel warm and fuzzy is open source. Because guess what? The system will be fully open source and designed with newly developed secure hardware. That scares me. To make the system not only impervious to certain kinds of hacking. So a good thing they had a caveat because you can't be impervious to hacking, but to certain kinds of ha hacking, maybe. It depends what that is. But also allows allow voters to verify that their votes are recorded accurately. So the thing that scares me about this, again, open source, good. And as long as it's fully open source, I'll, I'll be a lot more, you know, you know, that's awesome. But the system that's going to allow them to verify their votes are recorded is probably not going to be a paper receipt. The most easily obtained method I'm guessing they're going to be able to log into some sort of portal and see what their vote did. Well, maybe that's my theory. I didn't. I didn't read this all the way. I uh, so you know you can you can blame me for not doing my research, but I found this uh, actually tonight. It was actually a uh, article that was pushed by the algorithm to me. So you know for whatever that's worth. So I don't know all the details. Uh, again, the only thing I feel warm and fuzzy about is open source, but. 
you know, we're talking about the government. So you have open source in theory, but when it's implemented, how do you know that the source wasn't changed? Because it's on a machine you don't have access to. <laughs> so so it, it doesn't make me feel that warm and fuzzy, but it, it's good that there's an open source system they're proposing. Because I, theory, I, I believe that Diebold and any company that wants to do, if you want to do a voting machine and you get awarded the contract, okay, that's fine. It's, you know, uh, uh, innovation. We award you the contract. You should be mandated to put any source code, you know, in, in their case, Visual Basic. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if it was made in Visual Basic, but I'm guessing. So uh, you put your Visual Basic source code up on the Internet. You've just got to do it. And, you know, we could write laws that protect, you know, uh, it's open source, but not really open source. Like, you know, it's not allowed to be taken by anyone else. Blah, blah. If, if someone wants to steal a Visual Basic voting system. Anyway, <laughs> so we could write laws that protect you. But because it's a public trust, I mean, this is our elections. We should have public scrutiny of the code. It should all be public record. And we can protect it with copyright saying you can't take this code and, and use it for your own, you know, voting system. You'd have to create new code. The point is... No voting system should be closed source, hundred percent, right? I guess we'd have to have a, a different term for it, like not open source because not anyone can take it and modify it. It would be like um, translucent source. There we go. Coined today, March eighteenth, two thousand nineteen. Translucent source. No man, this uh, mine's mine's better. Clear source. But clear is clear is open. <laughs> I know, but it sounds cooler. <laughs> Clear source. <laughs> Patented today. <laughs> Patented, oh shit. On Spring Eve Eve. Well, I trademarked mine. Oligopoly, duopoly. No, duopoly, duopoly oligopoly. Oligopoly. <laughs> there you have it. Folks. What are we even talking about anymore? Are we on know. are we on topic? <laughs> we forgot that there's an open source uh, redistricting software called Open Redistrict. <laughs> Were, were you not aware of this? It sounds fascinating. <laughs> um, Open source, hey, that's good. Good stuff. Clear source. I'm sorry, it's not called that. It's called Auto Redistrict. Uh, just like AutoCAD or something, but AutoCAD's not open source. So, <laughs> anyways, autoredistrict.org. Uh, they have the uh, open source solution to redistricting where we can find out exactly what algorithms are used in redistricting our uh, districts. So, duopoly oligopoly, ranked choice voting, proportional representation, and I think we might have just solved... The United States of America's problems. Yep. All in an hour and a half. And to that, with that taper, I think, uh, I think we just, I think we did a public service. We did health. We did public service. I think we should get the Congressional Medal of Freedom or something. Yeah, and uh, there were at least three public service announcements tonight. That's a new record for packets and bolts. That is. But they won't be the last. No, they won't. Remember, uh, in the Times... Wait, what was it Ch Churchill said? <laughs> Something about darkness. Well, okay, here's another Churchill quote. The <laughs> I'm going to have to paraphrase because I can't remember it, but... The United States can always be counted on to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. So, now the music that I hear tells us that we might just be out of time. If you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> Is that a saying? That's, uh, that's a Winston Churchill quote. Oh, oh okay. Cue the music, Musgrave. <laughs> yep. Okay, so this is March 18th, 2019, Spring Eve Eve, Duopoly Oligopoly. I'm your host, Muskrat, co-host, Mongoose. Email the show, packetsandbolts at gmail.com. And uh, remember, keep packing those bolts. And until next time, C.
See ya. Real goat. <laughs>